Welcome to Positive Filter with your host, Fuller Wilkerson, a podcast that focuses on friends, family, health, and career with a little self-help along the way. Please join me in this journey for self-improvement, and I hope what I have to share will make you a better person, thus making the world a better place. I hope you enjoy the show. I hope you enjoy the show. I hope you enjoy the show. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. It's Philip Wilkerson back with another episode of Positive Filter. I'm joined by a special guest. Well, everyone's a special guest because they take their time to join me on my show. But I'm joined by esteemed Mason coach, Coach Kim English. Now, uh, if you know, I am a part of the Mason Nation. And so this is a really special episode for me. Uh, because, you know, definitely rah, rah, go Patriots. But um, I wanted to connect with Coach to learn a little bit about his journey into coaching, as well as how he takes leadership seriously and all that. But before we get into this episode, uh, Coach, can you give uh, listeners a little background on who you are? Yeah, appreciate you uh, having me on. Like you said, uh, my name's Kim English, head basketball coach at George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia. Um, I'm from Baltimore, Maryland, originally. I... Uh, Played basketball my whole life. Um, went on to play collegiately at the University of Missouri. Um, after four seasons there, uh, went on to play professionally in the NBA and abroad. Um, really enjoyed my time learning and playing professionally. Uh, but always knew that I wanted to get into coaching. Um, and if I wasn't going to have a career in the NBA, it was it was I felt like it was much more beneficial to start my 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 my, my career as a coach. Um, earlier than later. Uh, so I jumped right in it at the University of Tulsa for two seasons, on to the University of Colorado for two seasons, on to the University of Tennessee for two seasons. And um, am incredibly fortunate and thankful and, and, and um, excited to be the head coach here at Mason as we uh, try to rebuild this program um, back to what it was in the early and late um, 2010s-ish. Yeah. So I love that. I love that you actually spoke about that, uh, about you already earlier started to transition the mindset to being a coach from a player. Uh, when was that uh, in your was that during your collegiate days? We were like, OK, I'm gonna make it to the league and maybe, you know, do a couple of years. I really want to be a coach. When did that that mindset shift occur? Yeah, I always knew I was going to be an NBA player. Um, I uh, but I always also knew I was going to be a coach. So I always thought about both. Um to the point when I was inactive in the in, when I was inactive in the NBA, meaning I could, didn't dress for that game, I had a notepad on the bench. I sat, you know, behind the coaches and was always listening and thinking, and you know, subconsciously and intentionally building what my one day program would look like. Um, now that looks differently, right? If it's professional versus college, you have a lot more boxes to check off when you're talking about being a head coach of a college program. Your hands on a lot more things than just the basketball. Um, but I've always known, um, I've always been intentional about thinking and learning and listening. And um, I think it helps me now. I, I, I remember what it feels like to be a player, listening to what the coaches said and what worked and didn't work. And um, our, our program is a mixture of all those things from my past coaches I love it so you know thinking about your hybrid style or your coaching philosophy like when you were having that notepad uh who was some coaches uh in the game that you started to like you know study because you know like if you want to be a good coach you study good coaches so who are some of the people you were drawing inspiration from um as you were developing yourself as a coach well my coaches are the easy answer <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I had a really intimate experience up close watching them lead uh, Mike Anderson, Frank Haith. Um, uh, I worked for Frank Haith. Tad Boyle, Rick Barnes played. You know Tom Thibodeau, Lawrence Frank. Some international coaches. You know Luka Pavicevic, You know Nestor Che Garcia. Um, it it, it uh, though those guys had a big impact on me because I was privy to the day to day operations mm-hmm. of what it looked like and decisions and and um, structure and, and culture and systems and ideals and, and teaching uh, methods. But as I watch the game, and I've always been drawn to Shaka Smart um, <laughs> you know, from a, a leadership standpoint. Um, I think he's one of the best leaders in our game. Uh, Bill Self, uh, Jay Wright, from a uh, you know, systemic 
mm-hmm. systematically, the way they play, their approach to the game. Kelvin Sampson, his team's rebounding, toughness, and mm-hmm. physicality. Uh, those are guys that I, we're drawn to. I love it. So when you were, you know, I think basketball IQ uh, is very needed to be a coach, right? Like some people have a lot of raw talent, but then you, you hear about uh, IQ of a sport. Uh, what does that mean to you? You know, when you think about, you hear people say, uh, "Oh, that person has uh, a, a high, you know, IQ for football, basketball, and those yeah. things." And how how would you tell young people to train that? Because you're coaching young people. Yeah, well, it is what it is. I mean, it's 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 an intelligence barometer. Uh, but the thing about IQ, which I think is misconstrued, it mm-hmm. it it's it's not a final. Mm-hmm. Uh, 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 metric, yeah, right. It's something that can continue to grow, and that's it's really important um, because I'm I learn every day. Mm-hmm. Um, and when I talk to our guys, I actually had this talk with our guys last summer, and it was how do you become a smarter player, a more intelligent player? It's 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 you watch the game, mm-hmm. right, and you just ask yourself a ton of questions every single play. Ask why they did that, Mm -hmm. right? What was the other coach trying to accomplish? What was the player trying to accomplish, right? How did they do it, right? Where on the court uh, should they be? What was he looking at? You know, when when does he break open? You know, what's Mm -hmm. the situation, time and score? And you you just get to practice these situations time and time again. And then basketball, for the most part, it's a lot of uh, reoccurring patterns. Uh, it's, it's patterns. <laughs> yeah. it, it, it's, it's all patterns. So you, you, you see it, you know it, you know what to do. You know, you, you've seen it, this situation, every single time I've been a part of a team that's down 10 with one minute to go, I think of Duke coming back at Maryland and, and mm-hmm. beating the Terps. Like, it's, it, it goes in my mind every single time. Like, you know, I, I think of all these things. I think of Christian Leitner's, you know, last second shot against Kentucky, like that inbound play. Like all those plays throughout the game kind of run through your mind. But, um, you know, f- from a player standpoint, it's um, it's more difficult. I was about to say. I'm, because yeah. it's decisions in the split. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's the circuit in the brain and sending that message to your body and your hands and your eyes and your feet to make those quick-witted um, smart plays, but without a doubt, uh, quickness of mind is 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 more important than, than quickness of feet. Because I was thinking about that too. Like uh, we always talk about mindfulness and being in the present. So you try to study, you try to know, but then when it's, it's the game time, you can't be like, oh, let me just recall. You know, da, 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 da. you have to be like present. So it's there, like, there's opportunities for you to do that. You can on a free throw. You can during a timeout. You know, you can take a second to really think, put yourself mm-hmm. in a place. Um, you know, I, I, I think that basketball training um, should be very, um, you know, boring, if you will. Okay. <laughs> like uh, a process of the same drills every day. Remember, because the game is, I mean, really simple. It's you're, you're guarding the ball, you're, you're, <laughs> yeah. you're, you're playing off of a closeout. The shot go up, you go get the rebound. Someone shoots a shot, you can test it, right? It's, it's, but when you get in the game, I don't know what my opponent is doing. So you have to be able to go back to all those times of you just repping out the simple reads. If it's close me out left, drive right. Close me out right, drive left. Close out short, shoot it. Runs me off the line. You know, if he's if he's if he's beaten, he's recovering. Shot fake. You know, and the game does slow down. Like the game is slower than I think the average fan thinks it is. Oh, it's fast to me. <laughs> I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I see y'all going boom, 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 boom. I know. It, get it the ball fast. and run down. And, and but I'm sprint. telling you, when you when you train, when you study, when you train a lot, the game is slow. The game is really slow because what you you realize is you're in control. You know, they, they say, you know, obviously there's cliches, but be quick, not in a hurry. Mm. You know, tell our guys you, you you need to be you need to be early on defense, but you can be late on offense. Okay. You, know, you can be you, you can be slow on offense. It, it won't be. It's not the end of the world. You know, for you to play off of two feet instead of going up there jumping off one. You know, at the end of your drive, give a shot fake, pivot. You have five seconds after a pivot to make a pass. Right. Five seconds is a long time closely guarded. Yeah. If you think you know? about it, yeah. If you count one one thousand to five, yeah. one, yeah, it's plenty of time. 
So one of my thoughts was, you know, you could have coached at different levels. Um, and I, I think you did speak to it about the the coaching college is not just basketball. It's a lot of other things because you're coaching young men at a pivotal time and they're, you know, they're growing up and stuff. So was that particularly in your thought process of, you know, being a college coach as opposed to a, you know, NBA or professional coach? Yeah, I had an opportunity uh, to possibly join the Sixers when I decided to go to um, Tulsa. And I just think Sam Hinkie is brilliant. And I thought Brett Brown was great. And their entire staff has went on to do great things in the league. Everyone that was on that Philly team in 2000, at Philly front office or coaching staff in 2014, 15, whenever it was. Um, I ultimately uh, felt that I wanted to be in college. The mm-hmm. impact of the young players was really important to me. Um, but I felt better in that moment about, you know, teaching the college game uh, because I had success as an individual and being around successful college programs as a player. Mm-hmm. Sorry, college teams as a mm-hmm. player. Um, you know, and I didn't have success, you know, individually as a player in the NBA or as a team. Um, now that doesn't mean you know you can't be a successful coach in the NBA if you're having that success as a player. Mm-hmm. But um, I felt my calling was a college game in that moment. Now, now with that uh, added responsibility, you know, I think about you know you're a black male, uh, particularly predominantly your team are black males. Do you have this extra layer or responsibility in your mind to say you know I have to be a role model? Or do I have to, you know, really invest and mentor? I, I'll be transparent because when I work at George Mason, um, I see that, like, no matter what, you know, I hate that, you know, um, Charles Barkley thing, like, I'm not no re- no role model. But then at the sense, like, just being, you're just your normal being, you're someone's role model. You can't help it. Uh, and I take that yeah. mentally, subconsciously, and overtly. Yeah. But what about you as yeah, a coach? I, I, first, I want to be there for them, first and mm-hmm. foremost. I want to be there for them. Um, um, you know, and, and, and I want to help them. Um, and I want to know, want them to know that I, I love them mm-hmm. and care for them and will do anything for them. Um, that's the most important thing to me. Um, I want to make sure that they're, they're heard. Uh, that I understand their feelings when they see things that have been going on in our country the last few years. Mm-hmm. Um, um, and I want to help them athletically reach their wildest dreams. Um, mm-hmm. Now, the fact that I am a black male mm-hmm. and I understand we come, f- f- most of us come from the same socioeconomic uh, background, um, very similar neighborhoods, albeit different cities. Um, uh, it, it's It's... All that stuff is important to me first and foremost. And because I do things the right way, you know, come to work, take care of my, my, my children, mm-hmm. uh, treat them with respect, treat everyone with respect, um, love everyone. If they take that and, and see that and want to be like that, then that's that's a plus. But my aim first and foremost is is making sure they're okay and, and, and more than okay making sure that they're having as good of a George Mason experience as anyone. Yeah, so think about, you know, obviously, you know, this is not like a thought that you really, you know, want to tell a kid, but in your mind you're like, okay, you know, I got all these players, they're all talented, but the uh, the, the the funnel to the league is but so small. I want to prepare them for other things in life. Does that ever come to your mind too? Because you've been in it, you've seen – all the the funnel gets smaller for your experience to get to the league. It's it's like, I don't know. I can't do statistics, but I know it's like one percent or something like yeah, that. Yeah, less right? than one percent. One percent. It's small. It's it is small. Um, you know, it, it, I think those things aren't mutually exclusive. You mm-hmm. know, we're preparing them for careers in the mm-hmm. NBA yeah. as we're preparing them for careers in Europe, as we're preparing them for careers as coaches, as mm-hmm. we're preparing them for careers in corporate America yeah. or education or politics, yeah. whatever it may be. Um, I think these lessons hold true, you know, at all places. They're getting introduced to our amazing faculty mm-hmm. and supporters and uh, administrators. And I, I, I care, I really care that they build those relationships now as athletes so that, um, you know, 
that it's something that they can 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 tap into after their plan days are over. Do you ever see someone like you uh, with that notepad on the sideline and you, you see the spark that they might want to be a coach one day rather than a player? I, and you're and not just I don't know about just here rather but, than a player, but well, you yeah, know, I, I've like, I've seen I've spark. came across kids that um, may have that itch to coach. Mm-hmm. Um, I think VJ Bailey is that on our current team. Um, you know, I think I've had some some players that at uh, Tennessee that I think are going to be great coaches one day. Well, and how was that? I mean, when when you say you could you could see it, were they doing it? Were they just asking you a lot of questions after a play and trying to break it down themselves? Or no, it's come it's seeking you out outside of practice or or any other time and asking mm-hmm. why or walk me through this or why'd you say that or I understood that or it's the ones that um, you know it was me. I <laughs> man, in college, I. Um, Man, I'd be texting with Frank Hafe, you know, as we're watching NBA games at night. You know, on the next day in practice, he'd put in the play we're talking about. And so it's the it's the if if, if you're gonna be in it, if you're gonna be a coach, um, you have to be obsessed with it. Okay. You know, I, I, I'm I'm obs- I like to say I'm obsessed with, um, you know, my girls, my religion, and this game. You know, One, two, three. Okay. Like, like, <laughs> and, and honestly, it'd be my religion, my girls in this game. Okay. Um, obsessive. And um, it's, it's it's the truth. And if you're going to be exceptional in any field, I think there has to be a level of obsession. And yeah. I, I think it's very admirable. And this may be the wrong thing to say. I don't no, know, it's not. It's like the Kobe Bryant mama people, mentality. People talk about like, you know, balance and <laughs> yeah. well-roundedness. And it's just like... I get it. It sounds good, but like, you know, you you have to be obsessed with it if you're gonna beat out a very small percentage yeah. of people who want to be at that yeah. pinnacle. That makes sense. Um, I was thinking like, and that was gonna be leading into my question. Like, do you like you watch a lot of basketball like at home? Like, yeah. you know, like you you just coached it. You talked about it all day, and then you're gonna go home. Yeah. Do you turn on ESPN and start watching it some more? Like, yeah, absolutely, <laughs> like, absolutely. You can't get enough of it, and, okay. and I'm like not ashamed of that at all. Okay, right? It's it's far too competitive of a field where we're trying to go and we're trying to be at the mountaintop. It's far too competitive, and I'm fine. I'm healthy, right? I'm I'm healthy. I'm happy. I love it. It's the yeah. best. Yeah. Um, you know, I I I I get to I golf a little bit when the guys go home in, in May and August. Um, but it's it, it's a healthy obsession. It's what I look for in young talent. That I, like we have a grad assistant now named Matt Palumbo. Mm-hmm. He is a coaching star. He's going to be a star, um, and he obsesses over it. He obsesses over the game, um, and uh, it's I've never worked a day in my life. Got you. Yeah, you're chasing passion. Yes. Yeah, yeah. You kidding me? I get to come here and yeah. you know build a roster and build a schedule and get on the court with our guys individually and then have team practice and you know go find new talent. It's like I, I would I do it for free. I mean, yeah. Know. Yeah. Don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> now, okay, that's the part I like. Um, you know, like you talked about passion, chasing dreams, and they always say that flow state. Like this is something you would do. You know, subcon- like without money, but w- is there a point because um, there's the you have to win, you have to be successful to really be you know um, considered a success? Do you feel like that pressure sometimes takes away from enjoying the moment? And what I mean by that, like um, I want to be there, I want to be present, but then I got this pressure of having to win that sometimes kind of dilutes the. I love it or have fun with it. No, I don't feel that pressure um, because one, you know, succumbing to or 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 blinding yourself with pressure or outside expectations, it's literally pointless. You know, because there's nothing you can do in this very second to relieve pressure, mm-hmm. right? If if, if 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 winning is the goal, winning is the outcome, mm-hmm. right? Winning championships, even, you know. Put all your focus on what it takes to get to that, right? So we know what it takes to win. We know what that process looks like. That's what you 
dive into. And that's what you fall in love with. So if it's like, you know, we, we talked about this to our team before we played at Maryland last year. Like, it's, you know, I, could, I could see their faces with the kind of a look of like, mm-hmm. you know, this was a big moment. And it really wasn't, right? It really was not a big moment for our group. Deshaun Schwartz had, I mean, a thousand points and won NCAA tournament games have been on top 25 teams. Devontae Gaines has won everywhere. Davon Cook has been in the NCAA tournament this season. VJ Bailey has been a back to been a multiple Sweet 16s. He's a two time champion in the SEC and the Pac 12. Uh, Genica Ogiaco is an ACC champion. Like it's it's really the focus and, and the mindset of this. If we go out there tonight or every day in practice, and I play defense like my life depends on it. If I try to make mm. the guy across from me life a living nightmare, and when he shoots his shot, I'm going to contest it to the absolute best of my ability, and I'm going to be on defense with a swiveling head, having my teammates back in a stance. The shot goes up. I'm going to find somebody, and I'm going to put my shoulder into their chest and get them on my back and box them out and go pursue the ball with two hands, and now we're playing in transition offense. If I see someone open, I pass it to them. And we're playing offense as five with the mindset of we are going to take care of this ball and we're going to get the best shot we possibly can. If that's the mindset of every possession, I, I, you never even think about winning. You're not thinking about that. You're thinking about that. It's almost like you said earlier, like those micro moments of being present, like – Turn your brain off and say, I focus on those steps that you matters. said. I focus on the ball. I focus on this. I focus on that. Who All that I, is noise. Who, who am I closing out to? Is it yeah. is it Ben Simmons or is it Steph Curry? If it's Ben Simmons, close out short. If it's Steph Curry, don't let him shoot. Hyper focus. Right? Like if, 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 if you just focused on those things, the winning takes care of itself. You know, it, I wouldn't even, I, I, I could, you could not even like watch the scoreboard. Until the end of the game. Because you're focusing. You know, if we have guys, and a, a deep team, and guys that are completely focused on that, there is no, no pressure. I mean, you're going you're, to you're, you're gonna win uh, far greater games than you lose. Autopilot. If you have talent um, and, and, and you, you focus on that. All right. Well, this has been great. Uh, we're going to go to my last segment of the show. It's called Shot for Shot which is kind of applicable. I I didn't think about it for this (laughs) podcast, but um, you get to ask me any random question. I get to ask you any random question. You want to go first? I'll go first. Um, Maybe I'll go first? Yeah, you go first. Okay, I see that you have Art of War, particularly why um, literature outside of basketball you you think is good for the the game of basketball? Because I think, I mean... Art of War is a dope book, but yeah. think about, you know, talk about that. Some yeah, outf- we're gonna go outside we're basketball gonna, influences. It's, it's like 20 copies of Art of War. We're going to go through it as a team this season. I never, ever use, uh, I never, ever compare war to sport because it's not the same at all. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's very hard not to think as a leader or mm-hmm. want to know what um, military uh, leaders think or do or reasons why or how or ways they encourage um, and I just think it's a great book by Sun Tzu I read it I read it a few times a year actually um, or at least once a year but um, it's a uh, spectacular read and I'm excited to, to go through it with our team this season well I definitely I'm gonna send you another one um, the way to Dow have you read that before no. I'll send that to you it's really quick there's also like little quotes similar to Art of War and I think there's times where things outside of your normal nine to five can inspire. So I'll send that to you because yeah. I've read Art of War too, and it's pretty, it's like strategy and stuff. But then it's like you know the high man wins the grand, you know, like all this stuff. You're that like, stuff. Uh, that could no. be rebounding. I don't yeah, know. Like, no, like, I love that stuff. Yeah, I yeah. love listening to generals. Like, you know, when they were talking about the Ukraine and Russian, what's happening over there when you, when they have war general and vets get on there and talk about strategy and flanking or like where to go in I think that's so cool that they see that as way coaches see a game and, and understand strategy and mistakes and and um, also mindset they'll say like you could already tell if you, I think there's a quote in there about already losing <laughs> like if you go into it with this you already lost or you or you can um, mentally defeat your enemy 
like you could like beat them mentally before they even start battle. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's pretty crazy. Ninety percent. I've heard someone say ninety percent of college basketball games are won before the ball is thrown up. But like, I mean, yeah. it, it talks about war is not you know meant to be long. It's, you know, it's not meant to be long. Like, mm-hmm. like Ukraine's not backing down. That's not mm-hmm. what you know the opponent wants. They want it to be swift, quick, and and and, mm-hmm. and, and painless. You know. So. Well, but, um, lessons from outside that applicable. Yeah. Who, who, who's been your favorite guest on your podcast? Uh, so, okay, I have two, and I, I, I'm doing a cop out. Uh, well, actually, three. Three. Come on, man. No, because I, I got it. There's, okay, I'll, I'll do it like this, outside of my normal life and then professionally. That's so, messed up. I just said your podcast. Okay. Oh, one man. person. <sighs> That's hard. I, I would say my father-in-law. Okay. Because basically I just got his gems on record. That's awesome. And then, I mean, that's why he put me in a hard spot because I was going to say number two is my dad because he put himself on wax too. So I got these two father figures on there. And then I guess, like, I don't know, professionally, I don't, I don't know, I was thinking like Ann Holton or something. That's okay. how you know how we're just outside of the nation's capital, how political you just got there with that answer. You just, no. You made everyone happy. No, I didn't. know. No, okay. So, like, okay. Flat out, 100%, if you put me, like, the hill I had to die on, I'll say my father-in-law. And I'll say that without... That's a good answer. That, you know, because legit, like, I had him three times. He talked about his career, and so I got to do that and model that. Uh, we talked about living together, and we talked about uh, just him being a man and a father and all that balance. And a grandfather. And a grandfather, all that. Yeah. So, but That's then he awesome. put me in a spot because I was going to say my dad, too, because those are... I very rarely listen to my own self. But I've listened to the ones with my father-in-law and my dad over again for myself. Because yeah. for me, it's like having a conversation with them. So for my dad, my dad was one of the first blacks to go to VMI mm. uh, uh, th- the year they integrated. So I learned about his journey. And he was telling me things that he wouldn't. I was always interested. He's like, he's telling people on a podcast something that he's never told me. Yeah. Like telling me about pressure and letting his family down and, you know, being upset and crying that he thought he was going to fail out and all that stuff. Wow. He never told me that. Did you ever ask him? Why he never told me? Did you ever ask him, h- how did you get him to I, I literally up? just, on the podcast, I was just saying, like, did you, you know, during this time, did you ever think that you were well, yeah, not going to finish? Did you ever ask him that before your podcast? You never asked him that? Uh, no, I did. You okay. know, man, like, you know, like the father-son thing, like, okay. like, did he have a hard time? He gave me like a blanket and answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I think that when I have a hard time, oh, it's just me. My dad never went through this stuff. Yeah. You know, put your dad on the pedestal like yeah, I did. For sure. And I'm like, my dad never worried about failure. My dad was, you know, the man, da da da, army colonel. Yeah. And I got a chance to see that. I was like, this dude is really telling, I literally said it in my mind. I was like, he's telling an invisible audience stuff that he never told me. Yeah. So I listened to it over again. But yeah, cool. my father-in-law is the opposite. My father-in-law has told me these things, but then he also puts it on wax. He's a he's more of an open book than my my dad. So for me, I listen to both of those over and over again. Like yeah. regardless of if I had famous people or not, I listen to those two episodes or three or four. I just literally turn them on and listen because it's, for me, it's like as I said, it's like having a conversation with my my mentors. You know? And yeah, that's awesome. I don't know. It's pretty cool. That's awesome. I don't know. So this is great. Uh, this is you know this has been a really great experience. I'm so grateful for your time. Uh, this is the part of the show I call shout outs and plugs. So you get to shout out, show love to anyone you want to show love, and then plugs. Plugs will be how you want the listeners to engage with you and things that you want them to be uh, aware of, so I can put them in the show notes. I'm bad at this. I, I don't. Um, I never retweet anything written about me. I don't repost things on Instagram. Like I don't. I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm opinionated yeah. on my social media, <laughs> yeah. but I don't really promote my social media. I never have yeah. ever said follow me there it is. or follow this. So I'm not the best guy for that at all. But uh, follow at Mason MBB there it is. <laughs> on, uh, on Twitter and Instagram and follow our program and um, really excited uh, about what we're going to do. I am too. And I told you, and the listeners don't know this, but I remember you gave me and my son tickets, and I really appreciate that. And I'll say this as we end out the episode that 
Mason basketball and supporting you has given me and my son another father son activity. Nice. So I can He won't. He won't let me go all the way to like DC or whatever. But he'll come down to Fairfax, yeah. get a you know lemonade and popcorn. I get to enjoy yeah. the game, and so that's going to be definitely from now and moving forward. That's definitely going to be a Wilkerson family awesome. thing. That's that, great to hear. Well, if you have any tickets, parking pass, whatever, let me know. I got well, you. I'm there, and you can come to practice. He can shoot around, whatever. Our gym's always open. Oh, well, he'll love that. Well, so. He's here here on the wax. But um, thank you, Coach English. It's been great. I love learning more about your your journey as a coach and just the things I took notes as I do with every episode because this is also for me to learn. Um, I'm really excited for what your team is going to do this year and every year and wish you many success. And um, we're – oh, Father the Filter listeners, if you want to like this episode, please share it with a family member, a friend, subscribe, all those things. And if you want to leave a voicemail for the podcast, it's 571-336-6560, 571-336-6560. Sharing positivity is a movement, and we're out. Thank you for listening to Positive Filter, a podcast that focuses on family, friends, career, with a little self-help along the way. If you enjoyed this podcast, please share it with your family and friends, and like the Facebook page, Spreading Positivity of Movement. Thanks for listening.